I'm delighted to introduce uh, this stellar panel of alumni today who are going to share with you what it means to work for an international um, company. Like our audience today, our panel is based all over the world and we can't wait to hear the discussions that will come from today's session. So I'd now like to hand over to the panel chair, Catherine Casale, who is a careers consultant at UCL Careers, but she is also someone who has lived and worked in four different countries. So Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Andy. I'm really excited about this event today because I know that working globally has so enhanced my life and I'm excited to hear about our, what our panelists have to say. So just my quick intro is my first graduate job was in Japan. My second graduate job was in Japan. I transferred with that company to London. And I'm gonna emphasize that period just because I think at that age and those very different perspectives I got, working both in a Japanese firm, an international firm, the same international firm, both in Tokyo where I was just running the office alone and working here as part of the London team, just gave me such a wealth of early experience. And now I'm going to go on to our panelists. So would Nisreen like to introduce herself? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Catherine. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nisreen Farhan. I'm a graduate of UCL Economics and Statistics in 1993, a really long time ago. Um, after UCL, I went over to SOAS to do my master's in finance and development. And from there, I interned here and there. I did a few odd jobs. And then I moved up to, uh, and I worked in a central bank in the Middle East, um, and then moved up to Durham to study for my PhD. And from there, got a job at the IMF in uh, 2001. And I've been at the IMF ever since um, with a very rich career within the sphere of international organizations. I do have to say, Catherine, I noticed that Alistair's picture is taken actually at a wall at the IMF. So <laughs> interesting to see that there's something in common between us besides UCL as well. He's past the country wall. So thank you very much for, for having me here. Thanks, Ms. Ring. Uh, well, why don't we just go straight over to Alistair now? We'll keep that connection going. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Nizreen, and, and hi, everybody. Um, that's completely right, Nizreen. Um, that picture was at the fund, and I'd echo completely what Catherine said. Working globally has massively en enhanced my career in life, and so would 100% recommend it. I currently work at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office here in the UK. Um, it was previously the Department for International Development, um, which merged with the Foreign Office um, a couple of years ago now. Before kind of working for the Foreign Office, um, I worked for the Treasury. So I've spent about seven or eight years in the civil service now. And before joining the civil service, I did a couple of stints abroad. So both teaching out in Ghana um, and working for local government um, in Goa in India. So various bits of experience and delighted to be here and to have this conversation today. Thanks, Alistair. And we also have a connection. I looked you up on LinkedIn. We can talk about that later. Um, let's move on now to Fabiana. Can you hear me, Fabiana? Yes, yes, hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Fabiana Maglio and I'm a senior um, expert in education and international development. Um, I started working in this sector back in 2007 when I joined the Italian Development Cooperation Agency, which is part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I've stayed in this role for uh, almost 10 years, working in and out humanitarian uh, crisis, mainly in the Middle East and North Africa region. And then after that, I became a senior consultant for the United Nations. I've been working for UNICEF and the UNHCR um, ever since, um, still uh, managing and monitoring um, initiatives and programs related gender equality and child protection, uh, both in post-conflict and post-disaster uh, settings. And this gave me the opportunity also to travel to other parts of Africa and, and Asia. 
And I've studied at the IUE Institute of Education, UCL, back in 2015, and I graduated uh, with an MA in Education, Gender, and International Development. Thank you. Thanks, Fabiana. And now to you, Natalie. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Natalie. Um, hello from Hong Kong. Um, very different time zone. Um, so I'm a graduate in 2015 uh, with a Bachelor in Arts and Sciences. Um, so upon graduation, I moved back to Asia. And um, my first job was actually joining a firm, a UK firm that was founded by a UCL alumni. Um, and uh, since then, I, I then move on to a US company, um, Accenture, which is um, essentially a US consulting firm. Um, with that job, I traveled around in APAC, um, given the, the consulting um, job nature. And now I'm with Meta, I'm a program manager in Meta. Um, again, uh, working in Meta also gives me a lot of experience and opportunity to work with people, especially in the United States, as, uh, as well as in Singapore. So very happy to be here today um, to meet you all and share some of uh, my personal experiences. Thanks, Natalie. So our, our first question, I'm going to ask Nisreen, and that's, how do you embrace working with a variety of workforce cultures and ensure that you're culturally aware at work? Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, just to give you a bit of a background, the IMF has 190 um, member countries. Um, uh, the world has 195 countries, so a very wide cultures, very wide membership. At the office and at the IMF headquarters, we're about 80% in Washington, D.C. We have about 150 countries represented in the workforce. So from day one, um, coming in, for me as well, uh, as a background, I grew up in the Middle East, but very early in my years, I was moved to um, England for better prospects. Um, uh, Fabiana would like to hear that because uh, if I had stayed in the Middle East, I would have had six kids already. So in that sense, <laughs> and, and my, my career would have been very, very different. So in that sense, the doors were open for me early. So the culture that I got used to, um, was already open and diverse and coming to the IMF for me having a um, 150 different nationalities and different personalities wasn't a shock as such but it also took time to get used to and the biggest thing is we come from different cultures we come from different countries but we all had the same thought process we all had an anglo-saxon thought because we were all graduates of either UK, Germany, France, or the US. So you could connect at that higher level of, of, um, of the, the non-diverse thought process, but you couldn't connect on the cultural piece. And you could trip. And this is, this is basically um, a, a, a quick lesson in adapting to work cultures. Because first, you have to always be wearing a suit. Another thing that we had to worry about as well, the IMF in the early ages was all men in black suit. So, so, so coming in as a woman was also a, a different thing for me to adapt to. But the beauty of it is you make a lot of friends because you have a lot of stories, because like a very quick connection with Alistair, you have a lot of things in common. Even though you live completely different worlds, you find little things to connect to. And if I would, would um, um, hold on to anything over the past 20 years at the IMF, it's those little stories that we connect with from a person from a, a tiny village in Jordan, grew up in England, living in the US. I have something in common with somebody from South Africa, some, something in common with somebody from Bangladesh. It's beautiful to exchange those little cultures. So that's the first thing that I note. The other thing that is very interesting, and I'll come to that later as well, is that with an international organization like Fabiana and Natalie had said, and Alistair, we all travel. And travel exposes us to even more cultures and even more chances to trip, but also chances to learn more about how you can actually adapt. We become chameleons. It's really lovely how you, you can then go and meet somebody official in a country in, in Latin America or Asia or the Middle East, and then you can go back two weeks later and you can go back and be yourself. So you learn how to put on a package for two weeks and, and learn cultures and then come back and be yourself. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to rest while being a persona that you're not used to all the time. Thanks, Nisreen. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Alistair, do you want to take a couple minutes to follow on from that with any insights you have? 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting um, listening to Nizreen because I would agree with all of that. I think, um, you know, the opportunities that travel brings to being a chameleon and the finding kind of common stories with people um, are all really important. So I think that my headline point on this question is that I don't think it's hard, but I think it's really important. And I think I also really enjoy it. So for everyone kind of on the call, like I imagine you're here probably because you're internationally curious and aware. And I think if you bring that curiosity and awareness into a role, that takes you a long way there. Um, similarly to Nazreen, um, in the FCDO, we have country offices globally. And so there's the point of working with our colleagues who sit in country, but also their counterparts. So other governments around the world to whom we give advice and provide support to. And I think it's really important to kind of be humble uh, when you go to work in partnership with another country and realize that, you know, you're here to share, but also to learn, actually. And I think, you know, a lot of the issues with international development in the past have been around paternalism, whereas actually we want to move much more to a space of partnership and, and mutual um, learning. Just to share one story, I guess, about the importance of cultural awareness, but also how you can kind of bring a lot. So, you know, Nizreen talked to the IMF in the past being men in black suits. Um, one of the things, for example, the UK government in the past would have been predominantly white. And actually, as a brown Asian from London, being able to go around the world, for example, when I worked at the Treasury on kind of G20 policy, there was a, a massive benefit I could bring by just being a more familiar face who maybe brought a different angle um, and actually could see that kind of commonality with others when I talked about my family being from India and I could speak a couple of words here and there like by learning you know when I went to Ghana and understood a bit of the language and so small bits can go a long way and I think if you bring that humility that curiosity you can you can bring so much to a role um, where you're striking partnerships and collaborating with people globally. And I'd, I'd just like to repeat, it's one of the best bits of the job, um, you know, traveling, understanding different cultures and feeling you add value. So I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, I'm going to move on to our next question, which is about working with different time zones. And I'm going to ask Natalie about that. So how do you consider international colleagues who are not based in the location where maybe most of the colleagues are located or anything else that you think is relevant about working with time zones. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Catherine. I, I think I have actually been on both ends. So I have been the majority and I've been the minority. Um, so my experience in, in the first job, which um, I worked in the UK firm, it was an expert network. Um, I was the minority um, because I was basically chasing after uh, global networks of uh, experts um, that could be based anywhere. Um, obviously, at that point, I was the minority. Um, I had to wake up at the most ridiculous time trying to schedule call. Um, and then later on, when I became a consultant, um, I more or less became, the team was more or less in the same room. And now in my current role, it's, it's again, very similar. Sometimes I am the minority, sometimes I'm majority, depending on the project. Um, I think uh, in general, there are three key um, tips that I kind of um, accumulated over, over my experiences. Um, the first is just recognize that working across time zone is going to be the thing. Um, earlier on when, when, when we were just chatting, um, we basically mentioned that especially with COVID, um, more people are now more open to this concept of working from home. And hence there'll be a lot more collaboration and because people kind of expect that, you know, oh, you can go on Zoom, you don't need to be in the office. Um, there will be more and more of these um, calls internationally. So I think it's it's very important to recognize, as I mentioned, uh, it's not just you, even though you're the minority or even though when you're the majority, um, it actually also means that the other person um, on the call is probably working um, across like a, not like the most favorable time. So um, if, if you're leading a team with different people across or if you're hosting a meeting with people across, um, just be aware. It's very important just to be aware that um, basically there are people that might have different needs. Um, so the third point, I think, um, I think it's it's quite important to which is you know basically define whether or not it's like a one-off meeting or um, 
an ongoing, a regular cadence. Um, I think in general for one-off, um, the way that I, I cope with working with these time zones is having these mental block of time and, and people that you work with. So for example, um, in, in a role you, actually have like a, a pretty clear idea on, for example, people in Europe, I work with people in India, people in Australia. I realized there's a meeting with these people I immediately know, oh, Europe is going to be um, before end of my day. Um, US is going to be early on in my day. Um, having these mental um, block is super important. Um, so that's one tip I want to share. Um, there are a lot of uh, online tools that uh, allow people to do uh, time scheduling. Um, and I really recommend we use it because sometimes working across time zone, especially for, for a country that has like half an hour um, time difference, creates a lot of chaos. And, and you wouldn't be like, you, you won't want to wake up at like a ridiculous time and be like, oh, Oh, I missed a meeting. So that's um, basically for one-off meeting. For regular meeting, I actually suggest working out time that's easiest for both sides, even though you're a minority, um, just because of the sustainability um, consideration in this. If you always have to wake up at 5 a.m. for a call, obviously that's not going to be sustainable. Um, in a scenario where if you really can't adjust the time, then I suggest um, basically trying to do rotation. So for example, like trying to do one week, you wake up earlier, one week of the other team trying to get up a bit, uh, stay up a bit later. Um, depending on obviously your organization, but uh, so far I find these two quite important. Um, the last point I wanna wrap up is for all these uh, cross time zone collaboration, just be very mindful and respect everybody's time. Um, if a call is not required, feel free to cancel it, like, like even last minute, um, because obviously you don't want you yourself or the other person waking up at like a ridiculous time and wasting everybody's um, airtime. So, so far it's been working fine for me and I hope this is useful. Thanks, Natalie. That's really helpful. And we're gonna move on now to our third question which I'm gonna start with uh, Fabiana with this one. How has working for a global company helped you with your career development? Yes, thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, so for starters, I think making the decision to work for a global organization forced me to step outside my comfort zone. So this opened up new opportunities and in particular to, to stay abreast of the latest development in my field. So education and in humanitarian settings as I progressed my career in a over overseas role. So I think that working with such a large and diverse community, I had plenty of opportunities for networking. And this, um, this is in general is beneficial if you're interested in changing roles internally. But it was also beneficial for me when the time came to uproot and move to a new, uh, a new role in a new organization. So you're likely to have friends and ex-colleagues in companies that you're interested in moving to. Uh, so it's useful starting point when it comes to researching and reaching out to, to potential employers. Um, I still remember having a conversation with my mentor about uh, working for a global company for the first time. And I remember he said that when working cross-culturally, life may feel more vivid as if the sense of being alive is intensified. And this is perhaps because when you're having uh, to pay attention to a lot of things that you would normally take for granted in your in your home culture. Uh, so definitely global work experience leads to to an enriching experience and whether it's a, a short or longer term role, uh, I think that international uh, work experience on my CV uh, gave me a valuable advantage when I returned home. 
um, so in general, I noticed that a global perspective is highly uh, regarded by employers and this will open up to, uh, to new opportunities in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Fabiana. I'm gonna follow up on some of these questions afterwards once I make sure that we've everyone's had a chance to cover our basics. So I'm taking some notes on what you're all saying because so much is resonating with me. But I'm gonna move on now and uh, ask what the disadvantages are to working for a global organization. And I'm going to start with Alistair on that one. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I, wanna, I want to say none because obviously we're all extremely biased and um, we, we love working in this space. Um, but I think, I think there is one that's come up for me and I'd be interested if, if others resonate with this. So, so the one that, that kind of sticks with me sometimes is being quite far removed from the impact. Now that's not always the case because I think Nizreen talked about travel, for example, and I think you can mitigate that, for example, by traveling in country and understanding the sorts of projects and programs and what they deliver on the ground. But just to put this into perspective, so the team that I work in within the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office tries to help, tries to partner with and support lower income countries to collect more tax, collect it better, and then spend it better and in a more transparent way. And so what that means effectively is one, I'm working from London, but on lots of issues related to Uganda, Rwanda, South Africa, et cetera. And then two, in comparison to, for example, humanitarian work where you're trying to solve crises in the moment and hopefully what you do now might save a person's life tomorrow, the sort of work we're looking at is kind of gonna have an impact probably in 20, 30 years time, if at all if we're ever able to understand properly the impact we have <laughs> in a positive or negative way. And so because of that, it is sometimes quite difficult to get that motivation sometimes because you don't really see the impact that your work is having. That is not definitely not always the case. And there are lots of ways to mitigate that through travel, through speaking to people, through seeing that what you're doing now can have an impact. For example, through political influencing, seeing results in legislation, seeing revenue gains in the country. Um, but I just thought I'd highlight that as one area where I sometimes do find it quite difficult. And I think if you were somebody that always wanted to see your impact, you might have to just think about how to play that, whether you do different roles where you sometimes see the more immediate impact. For me, for example, I volunteer on the side for an organization working with young people where I do see that immediate impact. But I'll stop there. Thanks, Catherine. Great, thanks, Alistair. Now I'm going to go back to you, Nizreen, because you two are playing tag together and ask yeah. your thoughts on this question. We are quite, uh, um, Alistair has answered it for me as well, but I also want to say Fabiana said a lot of things that resonated with me on, on uh, um, career development. So if, if there is a chance, I'd love to also give a little bit of the long term perspective, but on the disadvantages, certainly um, what Alistair said resonates with me a lot. Um, you don't see the fruits of your work immediately because you because it's long term development. The, the particular work that we do in economics and development does take a long time to see, but there are little wins. And on a personal level, my life is always about little wins. Um, to what happened today, I'm very, very grateful about what comes tomorrow is tomorrow. So I do find that holding on to little little things in life is what keeps me going in my work. Um, you know, I, I remember very deeply a story that still resonates, especially seeing what's going on. I worked on Yemen in 2003. Um, and I remember sitting in the Department of Statistics in Yemen, and there was no war then. Um, and sitting hand in hand with somebody who has been putting together the uh, price index for the country, and he had no clue why a price index is important for policymakers. And walking him through that process and telling him that without this price index, we can't do policy making at all, zero. So that his minister of economy, minister of finance, central bank governor could not do what they do if it wasn't for the work that he does. And that for me, I've still got chills from it when I remember that story. That for me is the story that I carry with me throughout my career. I have similar small stories from countries in Africa, et cetera, because that is the impact that we leave. It's that little, uh, you know handover that we do that that basically tells them thank you for doing that 
And that's especially more important for me now seeing the devastation in Yemen. In so many ways, it keeps me connected. I've done the same with Libya, etc. So yes, you don't see the fruits, but if you look for those little stories, your impact is there, which is absolutely lovely. On the flip side, at least for the IMF, the stress is tremendous. You know, the stress, the personal stress, because I feel responsible for those stories in Yemen. I feel responsible for my work and for everything that I do that does affect people, put them in poverty because the IMF can do that. But I do feel responsible for my work and that comes with a lot of stress, but also being on your feet all the time. You meet governors of this country and people from that country, you really have to be at your best all the time and that's very stressful. And for me, the last point that I leave with you as well, also on a personal level, I left home in my late twenties and home for me was England. My family is still there and I still miss it. It's been 21 years and I miss being in Europe. The US is lovely. It's my new home. For me, wherever I lay my hat now is my home. I have two kids, I'm a single mom and I love my family. I love my American family, but I miss being at home and you can never, I've missed my friends. I've made so many more friends, such rich life here, but I miss my friends. And like Natalie was saying, I am very grateful for UCL to also have adopted that new era of working and doing those Zoom meetings because one, it connects us with our good old friends, a part of life that we don't want to give up, but it's also kind of a way to, to keep connected and keeping us tied to a world that we really really relate to, even though we're working on something else. So missing home is a difficult thing when you, you're constantly traveling. It really is. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nisreen. I'm really glad you brought that point out. Um, I was wondering whether anyone's going to mention it. And we'll be talking about the pluses some more um, as we go on. But, but that is something that I especially think for uh, younger people need to think about, that you when you work globally and live globally and maybe have families and children globally, in some ways you permanently are, you might become a citizen of the world, but you also are never really completely at home somewhere and you can miss places. And sometimes you don't even realize it until you go back after a while and you're like, oh, I forgot all about this part of myself. This is a huge part of me that just doesn't really isn't alive right now. So it's all part of this complicated mix. I'm going to ask the last of our pre-decided uh, questions, and then I'm going to follow up on some things. So I'm going to start with Natalie on this. What would you give, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to work abroad? I think actually the, the answer that I kind of um, saw through has been covered by um, many of the questions previously. Um, the, the three area I have one is just being very open. I think it has been covered by a lot of the answers already. Working abroad has so much to offer. It's going to be a very different experience. So being open is actually super important. The second part, which again, I think it resonated with a lot of the point is recognize and respect the differences, um, including culturally how different it is, including understanding context. So even the the, the, the country that you're, you're going to work abroad, the development stage could be different. And just be very humble to ask about these differences, um, languages, habits, or even the definition of professionalism. Um, I will share a very funny story. Um, when I was still a consultant, I, I traveled to work a lot and I worked with quite a few um, state-owned companies in China. And uh, it was a complete shock to me that um, every day at 1 p.m., there will be chairs laid out and people will start taking naps. Um, I was in complete shock. Um, I was not aware that you know this is this is like a thing. Um, but you know habits or or, or 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 perception that you might have in where you grow up might not be the same in, in the place that you work abroad. So um, res be respectful and recognizing the differences. And the last part, I think, um, just now someone also covered this. With recognizing that uh, this working abroad experience um, is something that you can probably bring where you came from into the new um, team. At, at the same time, you will bring whatever you learn away back with you when you go back to your, your home country or wherever you decide to go next. So yeah, I think these are the three advices that I would um, give anyone who is looking to work abroad. Thank you, Natalie. And now, Fabiana, I'm going to ask you your thoughts on that question. 
Yes, thank you, Catherine. Yes, I definitely agree uh, with what has been just said. And I feel that preparing for cultural differences ahead of time can ease uh, the moving experience and help you get settled. But I think it's also very important to understand the, the organization or the company's culture. Um, so if you're planning to join a new organization and move abroad, so I think it's important important to make sure that you have a sense of that company specific culture. This can be especially true of work life balance expectations, which can differ from location to location. And then again, network effectively is definitely another important point uh, for many professional that can help you adjust to your new place, new role as well as uh, find a mentor who could give you, uh, who could guide you uh, to grow um, and also give you career advice. Um, I feel that anticipate language differences is also uh, crucial. So depending on where you're going, you might speak a different language than those in your destination country. And although um, it's not always possible to learn uh, the language like extensively. Uh, try to learn as much of the language as you can ahead of time. Uh, you might uh, choose to focus on practical words and phrases uh, that will help you navigate uh, in your work. And I felt, uh, especially when I traveled to the field and I spent time with school communities, local communities, students, parents, uh, even uh, knowing a little bit of, of the language, using some keywords, it helps to, to build consensus, break the ice, and establish empathy with them. So I think it's very important. And last but not least, on a more like personal um, perspective, I would say it's important to stay positive if you decide to, to make this important uh, uh, move abroad. So you will probably experience challenges of some degrees when you're looking uh, for work abroad, when you're moving, when you're getting into a new position and adjusting in a new country. But I feel that keeping a positive outlook has helped me like make these challenges easier and more pleasant to, to navigate all the time. So looking back, I felt that uh, I was more likely to find solutions to challenges when I did my best to maintain this positive attitude. Although it's not easy, but you know, try, try your best. Thank you. Thanks, Fabiana. Thanks for finishing on that positive note, because something that I have been picking up both from our conversation before the event and during it, and I'm wondering if it's a theme, is that uh, looking at silver linings, uh, focusing on the positive, you know, it's come up more than once. And I think it definitely is a, a necessary skill when working in an environment that is very different and sometimes can even be hostile. So I've... Um, I picked out some words that all of you said that I really that really resonated with me. One was about becoming a chameleon, um, but Nizreen also made the point that you might be doing that for a couple of weeks, but then you might have a period of rest if you go back to the environment that you're living in. That's not actually something you'll have if you are in situ in the country. So that also requires some uh, skills. And the word humble has come up twice. You know, Alistair said it, and then someone else followed on with that. And I loved what Fabiana's mentor said about it being a more vivid life. And I definitely would agree with that. Whenever I was having a bad day, for example, in my first job in Japan, I think, well, okay, I'm having a bad day, but I'm basically getting paid to be on hold and developing professional experience. It was just a, a case of reframing it. And then I also just love what Natalie said about even the de definition of professionalism can be different. And I think that with those, I think I've covered something that everyone said. I think it, it gives a kind of round picture of what's required. Now, we've got a couple of minutes before we're going to 
onto our Q&A session. And I know Nizreen said that she had more she wanted to say. So I'm gonna open it up to all of you now, but I'll start with Nizreen and the others you can let me know maybe in the chat box or something. If there's anything you wanna follow up on of a question I didn't ask you, but something that resonated that one of the other panelists said. So starting with Nizreen, you had some more you wanted to say. Thank you very much, Catherine, for giving me that opportunity. And I want to pick up on what Fabiana said. She's humbled me in that sense and what she said as well. Um, I always, I'm a very positive person and looking at life, if we're lucky enough, you know, we're all, we all live in, in luxury of being in advanced uh, uh, countries. If we're lucky enough, we'll all live around 90, 100 years if we're lucky. Our health situation, et cetera, notwithstanding. So looking at that long view is really important. Every single experience we have, the good and the bad, is a story we can tell our children, our family's children, if we don't have our own. It's a story we keep together. It's books we're writing. It's our very rich history. And in the end, the only thing that I would say that I, I my career at the IMF is 21 years. I've been there for 21 years. I have not changed at all in that sense, but it's what I made of it inside the IMF. I decided to make a career for myself that is very, very rich and vivid, as Fabiana saying. I worked at the board, then I moved to the Middle East department, then I moved to the Africa department, then I moved to strategy, I worked on vulnerabilities. I am now a communications expert, and in the middle, I did digital finance and digitalization, modernization, and IT. I'm an economist, and I became the digital specialist at the IMF for modernization and IT. You, may, you can make career moves and learn open up books and books and learn because we know the privilege that UCLA gave us to think outside of what we are really just had been taught to do really opens up so many doors so in the end what my message was the long view for all of us is you might be in a job that you don't like today but you can if you're lucky enough and if you're willing if you just open up that willingness you can be in a different job or in the same job with a different thing that you're doing so there's so much richness to do, and that's the only thing I wanted to say. In the long, if, if you look at it, if you look at life and the hundred years that we end up living, it's just a rich experience after the other. That's that's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Thanks, Nazreen. And now back to you, Alistair. Thanks, Catherine. And um, may, maybe three points just to come back on what others have said. So. Um, First on Fabiana, and I think, yeah, that quote, um, I need to get on a wall frame somewhere. I, I also love that. Um, Fabiana's point on positivity. So I think there's a kind of the positivity of when you have challenges in country, for example, that people have spoken about, but actually also just positivity of applying for stuff in this space, right? Like it's a really competitive world. A lot of people want to work abroad. So speaking from my own experience, when I went to UCL, and I should have mentioned this before, I studied philosophy and economics, and I was very um, particular about what I applied to. Not a good approach, but the only thing I wanted to go for was at that time, DFID, the Department for International Development, and I didn't get into the grad scheme. And, and actually, seven, eight years later, I have got into the organization, but it's a bit of a roundabout way. And that's a long way of saying that you'll get plenty of knocks in this process, right? And I think you have to see it as kind of, they're all part of the process. My grandma always used to say everything happens for a reason. And at the time when I didn't get into that, I wouldn't have believed it, but, but actually it definitely has because I brought in other experience into the organization that's greatly benefited me. The second point was to come back on what Nazreen just said, which I think is completely true. Like we live in a world now where you have such a long career that you can definitely like do lots of things. And at the time that I was applying for the treasury, I actually had to choose between the treasury and a job in management consultancy. Now, at the time I chose the treasury because I enjoyed the recruitment process more. I know you're not supposed to enjoy recruitment processes, but I did. Um, but in another world, I could have gone down a completely different route. And so there are lots of opportunities to chop and change. And I'm not sure I'll be a civil servant for life. And so I definitely will fulfill that, that trajectory of going and doing different things. And then the final point was just, Catherine, you talked about the kind of the difficulties that working abroad brings. And I think that is a really important point. And I think the other side to that is, you know, people on the call, I guess there'll be people of various ages. Um, so this won't be true for everyone, but I think for a lot of people that I've spoken to, people have said, you know, I wish I did it earlier or like trying to take those opportunities as soon as possible. And I'm, you know, just before the pandemic, I, I was supposed to get a job in Kenya and 
I was about a week away from flying and unfortunately the pandemic meant everything fell through but now I look ahead at things and I'm getting married in a couple of months time and I only I feel that the trajectory of life is only going to get harder for potentially doing those things and so you know one one nugget I think that I've heard from lots of people is do, do it ASAP like it will benefit your career why not and um, it, it can potentially only get harder so no reason to, to not go for it now. Thanks Alistair. And Fabiana, I'm going to give you the last uh, freestyle question, and you've got one minute. <laughs> and then we're going yeah. to move on to the uh, Q&A. Thank you, Nath, uh, Catherine. Yes, so going very quickly, going back to the question number one, how to embrace working with the with, um, a variety of uh, cultures and also how to be culturally aware. I think that two main points that were really lesson learned for me. So the first one uh, would be to bridge the cultural gap by uh, making a little bit of research on foreign colleagues etiquette in advance. Uh, so to have the most positive experience possible. So I remember the first time I was in the Middle East, uh, I felt that, you know, sometimes informality can be inappropriate in some specific countries, such as addressing a new colleague by the first name at the initial contact. So um, I uh, definitely learning a little bit more about the background of your colleagues will help to be more culturally aware and learn how to efficiently build relationships in the workplace. And last but not least, I think it's very important to celebrate diversity. And that's what we do in, in my current role uh, with, with my current colleagues. What we do, we, uh, for instance, host uh, dinner on International Food Day and have uh, colleagues bring a traditional dish from their homeland. And I think uh, this is a, a wonderful way to get together, uh, sometimes uh, during lunch lunch break or even outside office uh, hours to increase the team sensitivity to cultural differences, which can in turn enhance unity then uh, within the team itself. Thank you. Thanks, Fabiana. Okay, I'm going to move on now to our Q&A. And the first question, which has had the most upvotes, is how, and by the way, panelists, I think the efficient way to do this is just raise your hand if you're interested in answering this question. Uh, how has COVID changed working internationally, given that many companies have paused international business over the last two years? Anyone want to take that? Ms. Reen. Thank you, Catherine. Um, from the perspective of travel, because travel stopped for a year and a half, and because most of our work was with um, uh, countries that we used to visit and do face-to-face um, um, -face meetings with, um, we initially, in the first um, six months of the COVID pandemic, we stopped travel, we stopped all sorts of conversations until we got on our feet, because we weren't ready for hybrid um, or for virtual work. But um, one thing that has happened was we learned, and like Natalie had said um, earlier, most of our international travel became virtual travel. So for two weeks at a time, people would put out an out of the office, even though they're still in DC, I am now on a virtual mission. So we did all of our contacts with countries on Zoom, on WebEx. And that has also changed a lot because Zoom was the big thing at the beginning of the pandemic and then became Teams. WebEx is still used because of many security issues. So you, one thing that has changed is the standard rock solid, I only know how to do things in person. You had to adapt and learn technology very quickly. And if you think you learned Zoom, you haven't. If you think you've learned Teams, you haven't. There's so much that we can do with technology that that has definitely changed. But all of our mission travel, all of our international travel became Zoom travel, which posed a lot of problems for work-life balance. Fabiana mentioned that earlier, because now, even though you're actually out of the country, as you would have been in person, now you're actually in country, 
and you're working abroad at the same time. So the amount of work just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting. And you you can't you don't feel that you've left because you still have a lot of work that you're expected to do while you're here. So the amount of work and the stress has increased while we're doing two jobs at the same time, being abroad but virtual and being here. So that's one thing that has changed. And then I'll very quickly say that the other thing that has changed that we've, we've done differently is that now that travel is back, we used to go three times a year to a country. Now we're actually doing one time virtually and two times in country, which also changes, changes the, the relationship with our interlocutors abroad because you now see them virtually and you don't build those relationships that the in person will give you. So that add, adds to the challenge of building relations on a, on, a, on a forever basis, virtually, because we're not going to go back to what we used to. Hybrid will always be there. So we have to adapt to networking and building relationships that are close, but on, on, on screen instead. Thank you. Thanks, Nisreen. Alistair, over to you. I'll be brief because I know we've got quite a few questions, but just I would just add on to what Nisreen said um, by also mentioning another kind of change, which is around collaboration. So the, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the way it works in the international development space, it's more of a funder. So we don't necessarily directly provide technical assistance. We would fund, for example, the IMF or the World Bank or kind of local institutions in the UK to go out and provide assistance to countries. A clear example of that is sending our colleagues from the tax authority here, HMRC, to go and work with other tax authorities in low income countries. As well as what Nizreen said about, you know, there's the practicality of that travel not being possible. And in lots of cases, our colleagues came home at the beginning of the pandemic. That's meant that, you know, you sometimes have to build trust with people you've never met in person. And you might have to work with these people over long periods, but you never get the chance to meet them, um, which can cause massive difficulties. And also, you know, even people within your own workforce, we had a merger between the Foreign Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development in the midst of a pandemic when everybody was working at home. So again, you don't have that office environment where you can see, mingle, mix and collaborate, which can mean silos. And so I think it's a big thing to kind of try to mitigate for, for many organizations, both, both domestic and global, but I think particularly global because of that lack of face-to-face -face, uh, interaction because of travel. Thanks, Alistair. I'm going to move on to our next most upvoted question. Does the panel know which are some emerging cities that are attracting global workforces? I thought that was a very interesting uh, question that I hadn't actually thought about uh, that much before because I think... I guess that isn't the way I had thought about how you would go about looking for a job. I was wondering if any of you have, Natalie, you've unmuted yourself. Does that mean you want to answer this question or? I can share. Um, obviously, I don't have the view because I think my view is more kind of uh, Asia centric. Um, but to be honest, I think Asia, some of the country in a Asia has now opened up like Singapore. Um, so I think naturally within the region, um, those are the country that more people will travel into. Um, because I know that the past two years, visa has been a big problem for a lot of Asia international city, inclusive of Hong Kong and China. Um, China right now, I believe that the restriction is still quite strict. So I think just based on pure, pure uh, regulatory reason, I, I think at the moment, not too much international travel that's going in. But for sure, I, I, I foresee that um, becoming better in the coming one or two years. Um, so. In short, just want to wrap up to say, um, if you're looking for a job in, in Asia region, do, do check out on the regulatory, um, because I've heard that getting a visa lately has been uh, a concern with a lot of countries still kind of in a semi-lockdown mode. Thanks, Natalie. Alistair, you also want to add to that. Oh, I think it's Nizreen with a hand up, but I can quickly say one thing, which was just that, um, I think the question can be reframed slightly in a way, right? So. In terms of cities that are attracting global workforces, well, actually, because of the emergence of remote working, in effect, you can work for lots of places from anywhere. And I think it's a really interesting twist, right? So you want to work for the fund out in DC, 
but actually is it possible to do that from elsewhere and i think different organizations will have different um policies towards this but i think it potentially changes the game massively thanks nisreen did you want to add to that just very quickly, I want to say that we've been noticing a big pattern in uh, young people voting with their ethical feet. Mm. So yes, there's a lot of um, which city should we work with, but a lot of young people are also thinking which city is most, e most ethical, which company is most environmentally sustainable and ethical in that sense. So you might actually go there and then within a year, what we're seeing with the, with the global labor movements is that they go and a year later, they move because it doesn't fit our ethical standards anymore, which is something that we did not, I did not consider ethics in 2000, even though I'm a very ethical person, very moral in my work, it was getting a job then. And now what, what we're seeing is people go, but then quickly change jobs because of those ethical and moral standards that we've all become better at showing externally. Thanks, Nizreen. I'd love to follow up on that, but I'm conscious that Fabiana has to leave us within about a minute to go to another Zoom meeting. Is there any final thing you'd like to add? Thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, perhaps uh, I was having a quick look at the following question. Um, I don't know if I can uh, add okay. something. Yes, so I think it's the question about what would be the first step in moving to a global organization for somebody already with professional experience? So I can really like uh, share from my personal uh, uh, path. And I felt that um, being flexible in terms of, uh, of destination, it's a very important point. And I remember most of my colleagues were like trying to apply uh, to work in a more headquarter uh, setting. Uh, so in like capital cities in developed uh, countries um, and they were encountering some difficulties because obviously it's hard uh, to to get the job at, at the first uh, uh, tentative so in in my experience I uh, started from the field first so I applied to field location first and I felt it was easier first of all to get the job but also it was like um, a very enriching experience, although quite challenging, uh, but it was like um, a unique way to learn about the, the challenges and, you know, to learn firsthand on what happens at field level and and to to get listen to, to community themselves and, and then be ready to share the kind of practical hands-on knowledge once then you you shift to a headquarter role afterwards thank you thank you and thank you for joining thank you us very much. today okay thanks everyone bye 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 I'm just going to follow on with what Nisreen was saying about ethics. I struggled tr tremendously in my first uh, job in Japan, and uh, it was really around ethics or stroke, I'll call it values. And uh, it rather than leaving, it, it made me really stubborn and determined to stay because I couldn't reconcile my conflicts. And I didn't want it. I didn't. I was really afraid I was judging it through my own lens, through my own values, and I needed to reach some kind of peace with it, is perhaps the way to put it, and uh, that I eventually did. It doesn't mean I have to completely agree with it, but it does mean I can at least understand it from a different perspective more deeply. And I, I'm going to go to the next question that got upvoted, and this connects. What tools would you recommend to communicate effectively when working globally? I don't know if an old-fashioned book counts as a tool, but my recommendation is that you read The Culture Map uh, by Erin Meyer. She's an INSEAD professor. If you want a very accessible, readable way to start thinking about different perspectives around values, that's the place to start. Now, do any of our panelists want to follow up on that? Katie would like to answer. I could say something if you want, um, Catherine. Yes, yes. Um, so one thing I've learned over the past 20 years is that listening is not really listening. 
there is listening effectively, there is listening empathetically, there is listening actively. So the word listening over the years has really, really moved with my career and moved with my cultural sensitivities, etc. So the only thing that I would say is communicating effectively, starting with listening effectively. It's a cliche, but it really is. Take a deep breath. I've been meditating a lot over the past five years as well. And oh my God, that impact of a deep breath before answering, before just when entering a meeting, just take a deep breath, you listen better. Take a deep breath, you speak better. Seriously, listening is not a joke. You think you're listening, think again, you're not listening. So I think again, just to emphasize the key to communicating effectively is listening effectively. And I don't do it, I don't do it as well, I really don't. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Ring, for finishing up on that note. I want to thank all our panelists, and now I'm going to hand back to Andy, who will finish us up for the day.